All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hilary Zarin. I'm an uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellow. I'm being hosted by, as you can read, uh, the Office of Transportation and Air Quality at the Environmental Protection Agency. I work with a small, light, and fast center called the Climate Analysis and Strategy Center. I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of the um, advancements that I feel, uh, I think that we all would feel are happening um, at both at a policy level as well as um, for the consumer public with regard to greenhouse gas emissions in the light duty transportation sector. I'll explain what this means in a moment. So this is a, a broad overview of my presentation and some of the objectives that I hope to uh, attain speaking with you today very quickly for 15 minutes probably 14 now. So um, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you and demonstrate to you the links between climate change and transportation. It's often, we all know that it's important. We may not know how important it is. Turns out it's very important. Um, I wanna highlight some promising achievements in the transportation sector with regard to the greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm specifically referring to the light duty standards that were just recently passed last fall, pub, uh, published in the Federal Register in October of 2012 which very effectively reduces greenhouse gas emissions um, from automobiles manufactured during model years 2017 to 2025. So that's gonna be the crux of my talk today is about that, those standards that were passed. Um, I'm gonna highlight one challenge I see communicating with the public and that's just my personal opinion as serving as a fellow, not as an EPA employee, so keep that in mind as well. Um, and then some workarounds and opportunities that the, um, the staff that I work with under our director, Lisa Snap, have been doing to try to get out to the public about the relationship between cars and emissions and climate change. So this is just two basic pie charts for you uh, demonstrating the relationship between the uh, various end use sector emissions um, you have transportation, commercial, industry, residential. Transportation is the second largest uh, end use sector of greenhouse gas emissions on that uh, pie graph. And then to the, to the left, you see the more colorful pie chart that, is, um, that basically shows you how that breaks down. So passenger vehicles, in fact, are the largest greenhouse gas emitters within transportation, within that 27%, uh, 62%. So it's quite significant. Here's a cartoon that a colleague of mine, Jeff Olson, brought to my attention, which I think is really perfect. Um, this came out, I believe, it came out prior to the passing of a 2007 Stoller cartoon, but this is the Model T, very old car, the first model car. Um, it only gets 20 miles per gallon, but in 100 years, that'll be vastly improved. It turns out it wasn't. In fact, I, I rented a car to get here, and it was my, my average real-world fuel economy is 20.1. So, uh, and it's a very small economy car. Um, we haven't made any improvements, but our horsepower of our light-duty vehicles, and when I say light-duty, I just mean passenger cars all the way up through SUVs um, and pickup trucks, they have increased their horsepower to 200. So it's a factor of 10 that the horsepower has, has increased but emissions, the, the, the fuel economy and, and the associated emissions have not improved. So we've really been doing um, ourselves a disservice in our, in our vehicle technology, and it's a big deal. This is, a, a, again, from Jeff Olson, a colleague of mine in OTAC, um, who, is, who I'm sort of standing on, the, on he, the head of that giant because he's been very involved in EPA and has a very long and distinguished career and has loaned me some of these data and slides. Um, this is on the, uh, the miles per gallon. In fact, I think I have a pointer up here. You can see the, the basic trend. So this is the 20 that we, I just referenced in that cartoon and our emissions. And this is what, as a result of a variety of factors, most importantly, the greenhouse gas standards and CAFE standards that I'm gonna be talking about that have passed through EPA and uh, Department of Transportation. This is, this is all going in the right direction. So we see that um, the emissions of CO2 grams per mile, which is how they, how they measure the emissions in the laboratory uh, most effectively, are gonna go, be going down and the, uh, the fuel economy is going to be, or the fuel efficiency, the, um, the vehicle miles traveled and how much gas you need to do that is going up. So this is all a good news story. And it's a good news story. This, these are the numbers in case any of you are interested in those. Um, this is where, we're, where we are, and this is where we're going. Where we are, where we're going. This is real world. This is basically what drivers are getting in real world conditions. In the laboratory under two testing emission cycles, this is what you roughly get. So 
for the numbers geeks out there, that'll hopefully itch that for you. Um, this is a timeline of the light duty greenhouse gas cafe corporate average fuel economy, which is the de Department of Transportation NHTSA side. Um, this is, this is, for me, this is the sort of the victory part that I want to highlight. I know it's so easy to get caught up in the things that aren't going right and that federal agencies weigh everything down and there's so much bureaucracy, but this really is a really good news story. And it's a good news story, not just for the people who are concerned about climate change, but it's also a really good news story for consumers because there's a lot that is changing for the better in their, in their vehicle technology. There's a lot of savings at the pump that these folks are going to have. They're going to have a better, faster, cooler car. I'm going to get into that a little bit next. Um, but this is the political process by which this all occurred. It was also met with broad support, which is almost always unheard of when you have a major victory, a climate victory, or any other kind of victory in, in DC. Um, of course, it was very widely supported by environmentalists, which is a no-brainer. The state of California, also a no-brainer because they're very progressive with environmental standards. The interagency, there was quite a, a bit of collaboration. I wasn't part of it, but it, it worked. Here we are. Um, Probably most impressively is that the auto manufacturers, 90% of them were on board, and I believe all of them are on board except one now, uh, no names. Um, and <laughs> the United Auto Workers. So there was very broad level support, which is, again, um, a very positive signal that these things could be potentially moving in, in the right direction and also a good news story to take home from this conference. Um, why was it a victory? This is just a laundry list. There are many other reasons. If you're interested, you can read some of our regulatory impact analysis studies and things that you can find through the website, through EPA, OTAC, Transportation and Air Quality. But these are some of the benefits um, that have been both hashed out by economists and some that I just added on there. And you can all read, I don't have to go through that, but there's some, some big ones there. So this is what I, just me personally, find to be the challenge. Um, there's the tension inherent in climate change communication with the public and coming from someone who's been not an EPA employee, but someone who's been working closely with transportation and air quality um, in my role as a fellow, is this, this bottom arrowed this bottom sentence here, how do you convince the public that their individual and collective choices and actions are important as you confess that the sum total of their contributions is insufficient? And, and ultimately what we're dealing with, with climate change specifically, is that this is going to require a global solution. We can all do our part and we must do our part as individuals and as the collective of individuals, but we're to the point where we really do need a global strategy and um, this requires major policy intervention and collaboration and cooperation. Um, so this is, this is hard, this is hard. And, and it's hard when you tell the, the public that they still have to do so much work and carry a lot of this on their backs, but this is where we are. So that for me personally has been kind of a challenge. And um, so some of the workarounds and opportunities, now I wanna to get to the climate, uh, the, the communications part that, that the office that I work with, Climate Analysis and Strategy Center, has been um, doing. This, we've been trying to work out a communication strategy um, that encourages the right kind of consumer choices and driving habits with cars, um, makes very clear that there is a cleaner technology that suits their lifestyle, that you don't have to trade space, you don't have to trade power, you don't have to trade these things necessarily to have a cleaner vehicle. Um, and you know some of these other things tapping into culture, values, and interests, which several of you today have highlighted and I enjoyed very much, and leverages some research done on climate change and attitudes, beliefs, and practices. And the research I, we've been borrowing from quite heavily is the excellent climate change communications research that's been put out by George Mason University and Yale University. Uh, this is a, so a little bit dated um, Six America study. It breaks down the population uh, attitudes and beliefs toward climate change, alarmed, concerned, cautious, dis disengaged, doubtful, dismissive. So we've been tailoring some of the study, another, a, a, a different but similar study to, authored by the same, the same folks um, about clean energy and global warming. We've been trying to leverage some of this research and use it to, to come up with some innovative, cool, like forward-leaning, um, slightly cheeky, um, PSA, public service advertisements, some, some infographics, some video, some things that the EPA and OTAC can get out into the public and, um, and hopefully that will catch on things like social media. 
the quote in the middle here is, is from President Obama when he announced the national program in May 2010 that was on the timeline. This is his specific quote. I put in bold a couple of the key words that I think are important when you communicate about anything that's even remotely climate related or environmental. You have to highlight the other benefits. And I, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we focus exclusively on the environment. And I think the EPA as the Environmental Protection Agency will perhaps struggle with that more than other agencies. Um, but we have been doing some interesting work focusing on economic growth, energy security, focusing on innovation, US leadership, that, those kinds of attitudes and beliefs. Five minutes, okay, thank you. So economy, energy, environment, this is something that, I, that I've been working with my office on in my role as a fellow, uh, trying to, um, in, in the work that we do, in the analysis that we do, and in the writing that we put out to the public, um, no matter how dry, being sure to address these economy, energy, and environment sort of values or, or themes. Um, and I think that depending on your audience, you can tailor a communications strategy to highlight one or more of these things. So in certain audiences, you may want to highlight the economy more than others. You may want to highlight energy security more than others. Doing so is not disingenuous. I think that it is actually just a smart communication strategy and it allows you to access a, a broader array of the population. Um, so I'm hoping that the animations work. This is one of the PSAs, the, the advertisements we've had printed in uh, magazines, a lot of magazines you'll find on the shelves and stuff. This is just part of what OTAC has been doing to get the word out about a few of the tools. One of the tools being the new car label. I'm not sure if any of you have bought a car recently, but you'll see a label on the lot in the windows of the car. Um, it'll, it'll advertise the emissions, the fuel economy, the, you know, the, all, the, all the basic information you might want as a consumer. And um, this is what this advertisement looks like. It's, it's picked up, it's pretty short, but it's picked up a lot of, um, it's been quite popular and it's the one out of all of the ones that were designed by my office, it's the one that most of the magazines have wanted to actually print. Our website, if you're interested, if you go to the car label basic information under epa.gov, um, there's different li labels for the gas, the plug-in hybrid electric and the electric vehicles. You can learn more about the label. This is a new generation of car labels and it's part of this communication strategy. And then this is the cheeky, um, this was just emailed to me, which is why I was struggling to get this presentation loaded at the last minute. This was just emailed to me by my colleague um, back in DC because this has not been released to the public yet, but we did just get it back from our designer. And so you guys are the first ones to see it. Um, you won't find it on a website, but this is an example of us trying to be a little forward leaning and funny, <laughs> hoping that it gives EPA sort of a lighter, uh, more progressive feel. Times have changed, so have we. That's sort of the, the message. And then this is a, the final infographic, also hasn't been released yet, and, um, but has been finalized by the designers, tapping into some of the economic interests. What we're trying to do here is make it, you know, take a number and, and give it meaning to the average everyday consumer um, so that they know what they, what they could be gaining from this, uh, regardless of what their objective is. At the end of the day, I think it's pretty fair to say that everybody would like to save money. So thank you very much for uh, your time. And um, if I could just do a really quick plug, there's going to be a, a, a conference that dovetails very nicely with this one in DC in August, August 15 to 17. Um, I know several of you in the audience have been invited to speak at it. It's getting a lot of interest on, on um, social media. Um, it's going to be a, a really great climate change communications conference, and we'll continue to push this forward. So thank you very much for your time.